Welcome back, everyone. This is cardiovascular lecture number four, where we're going to cover uh, the cardiac cycle. We're going to look at all of the mechanical things that are going on in one heartbeat. So this is directly going to tie to our previous lecture, uh, where we looked at the electrical activity in the heart. Uh, and what we're going to see is uh, how does the heart respond physically to all of those electrical events. So now we're going to really focus on the difference between electrical events, which are those depolarization and repolarization, and mechanical events, which were the systole and diastole. So we talked about all of that last time, and today we're actually going to look at what happens when different parts of the heart are going into systole or diastole. So let's begin with our not really attendance questions. Trace the path of a drop of blood from the capillaries of the left lung to the inferior vena cava. And if the branches of the vagus nerve were teased away from their connections with the heart, what would the effect be? So try to answer these on your own without looking at any notes and without listening to the answer here, just to see how well everything's staying with you. And let's look at the first one. Trace the path of a drop of blood from the capillaries of the left lung to the inferior vena cava. So if we're in the capillaries of the left lung, we're going to leave the lung with oxygenated blood to head back to the heart. So from the capillaries of the left lung, we're going to go into some venules carrying oxygenated blood. Then we're going to get into bigger vessels, veins, and now heading back to the heart. We're going to, if we're coming from the left lung, we're going to come back in the left pulmonary veins and empty into the left atrium. Remember, blood from both lungs will empty into the left atrium. From the left atrium, we pass through the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, we're going to leave the heart, but first we have to pass through the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta. Remember, we're still carrying oxygenated blood, and now we've left the heart to go deliver that oxygen to the tissues of the body. So from the aorta, we get into smaller and smaller and smaller arteries, eventually into arterioles, eventually into capillaries at the body tissues. And if we look ahead, we're going to be in the inferior vena cava. So these body tissue capillaries that we're at will be somewhere in the lower portion of the body, so somewhere below the chest. We're going to drop off the oxygen at those capillaries at the tissues and move into some small venules, then we move into some veins, bigger and bigger and bigger veins, until eventually we're in the inferior vena cava. Next question. If the branches of the vagus nerve were teased away from their connections with the heart, what would the effect be? Well, the vagus nerve, it connects to a bunch of different organs in your body, and one of those organs is the heart. And the vagus nerve is actually a part of your parasympathetic nervous system. And your parasympathetic nervous system is what slows things down in your body. It's your uh, rest and digest, relax and reproduce function. So if we were to cut the vagus nerve away from the heart, we're really removing parasympathetic nervous system activity. So that requires you to think, what does the parasympathetic nervous system do to the heart? Well, it slows your heart rate down. It takes it from that normal 100 and slows it down to somewhere around 75. And if we were to remove the vagus nerve from the heart, well, now we're no longer slowing it down, so it's just going to fall under control of that SA node. And the SA node is going to pace the heart at about 100 beats per minute. So today, uh, we're going to start to lay the foundation for blood flow 
and blood pressure. Really, after today, the remaining uh, lectures for this unit are all going to be focused on the heart moving blood through the body and the blood pressure that that blood feels. So let's start to talk about pressure and flow. Liquids, which right now when we talk about liquids, we're talking about blood. But we're going to talk about liquids throughout this semester, so it's still going to be the same thing. It's just right now we're talking about blood. Will flow from place to place. And this flow, this movement from place to place, is governed by pressure and resistance. First, let's look at pressure. Pressure is just something that impels fluid to move. It causes fluid to move from one place to another. And every single time we talk about pressure this semester, which will be in practically every chapter, it's always going to have the same units, and that's millimeters of mercury. I think I said that in an earlier lecture, but just keep in mind, pressure, millimeters of mercury, MMHG. And something that we're going to see is when pressure is different, when pressure is higher in one area and lower in another area, things move from high pressure to low pressure. So that'll be kind of a underlying principle this semester. The other thing is resistance. Resistance is opposition to flow. So pressure and resistance are the two factors that govern the flow of liquid. Remember gradients back in Bio 137? Everything likes to diffuse down its concentration gradient. Everything likes to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Same thing's going to happen here. Everything likes to move from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. And depending on the amount of resistance, maybe it's going to move from high pressure to low pressure really, really easily. Or maybe it's going to have a little bit of resistance and it's a little bit harder for it to move. change gears a little bit, talk about heart sounds. We mentioned these a little bit back when we were talking about the just the heart anatomy. But, so heart sounds, when someone is listening to your heart, I think there was maybe a typo in your outline. I haven't checked to make sure that it was fixed. But when someone is listening to your heart, that activity is called auscultation. Auscultation. And that's listening typically with a stethoscope. And when they listen to your heart, there are two heart sounds. Typically, you'll hear them called lub and dup, or uh, the first and second heart sound. And the first and second heart sound, all you're listening to is the closure of those valves, either the AV valves or the semilunar valves. When you're listening, the first heart sound is the closure of the AV valves between the atria and ventricle. The second sound that you hear is the closure of the semilunar valves between the ventricles and the great vessels leaving the ventricles. In children, sometimes you'll hear a third heart sound. We won't really talk about that because we're more concerned with average healthy adult. So just know two heart sounds. The first is closure of the AV valves. The second is closure of the semilunar valves. Now, when you get into your programs and you're practicing this, you will actually be able to move the stethoscope around to listen to each individual valve, which is what you see in this image. We're not going to worry about that in this class, though. So now let's get to the heart uh, and speak about the cardiac cycle. So everything we're going to talk about over the next several slides occurs in one heartbeat. And remember, one heartbeat at rest, we have 75 of them a minute. So one heartbeat really takes less than a second. We're going to talk about this 
a little slower. So we're going to see everything that happens in that one heartbeat, and we're going to talk about it really slow. But just keep in mind, it happens really quickly. So we're going to begin with something called the period of ventricular filling. This is when the ventricles are filling with blood. Now, during this time, the atria, which we see up here, are filling with blood. And as they fill with blood and pressure builds inside of them, the AV valves open. And as the AV valves open, blood starts to move from the atrium into the ventricle on each side of the heart. And the ventricles begin to fill with blood. About this time, the SA node fires, the P wave spreads across uh, the atria, and we get atrial depolarization. So atrial depolarization, this is when we see the P wave on the EKG. As a result of that, we get atrial systole. Now, if we were to look at the heart, remember the atria, they're not very muscular at all. So there's just kind of a quiver. We don't really see a real contraction of the atria. It's just kind of a quiver. But that does allow a little bit of additional blood to be forced into the ventricles. Now, at this time, the ventricles are as relaxed as they are going to get, and they are as full of blood as they are going to get. So the blood in the ventricles at this time, that volume of blood in the ventricles, is called the end diastolic volume, or the EDV. The end diastolic volume. So let's kind of unpack that phrase. The ventricles are at their most relaxed, so they are at the end of diastole. The ventricular diastole is when the ventricles are relaxed. So, this is right before the ventricles start to contract to push that blood out. So they have a lot of blood in them right now. And that blood, there's about 130 milliliters in each ventricle. The end diastolic volume, about 130 milliliters. Step two is called isovolumetric contraction. Now, that's a, a big word. Most people have not seen that word before. Iso means equal. Volumetric means measurement of volume. So really, that whole word just means that the volume is not going to change during this part of the contraction. So let's see why that is. That impulse that we just saw spread across the atria continues to spread. We're going to get the QRS complex during this time. The atria are going to repolarize. The ventricles are going to depolarize and systole begins. So the ventricles are going to start to contract. Now they contract pretty quickly, but again, we're talking through this really, really slowly so that we can visualize it. As the ventricles begin, to contract as they go into systole, pressure inside those ventricles begins to rise. Pressure at some point is going to be higher in the ventricle than it is in the atrium. And remember, everything likes to go from high pressure to low pressure. So blood is going to try to flow back from the ventricle into the atrium. But the way these valves are shaped, when blood tries to go back this way, it actually forces that valve shut, and that prevents blood from going back into the atrium. So let's kind of walk through that again. Blood had just filled up the ventricles previously. The ventricles start to contract. As they start to contract, they're squeezing on that blood and pressure inside the ventricle starts to rise. And as that pressure starts to rise, it passes 
the pressure in the atrium, so the blood tries to go back the other way. When that happens, it pushes those valves shut, so blood can't go back the other way. Now, I keep showing it over here on the right, but the same thing is happening over here on the left. Blood pressure started to rise in the ventricle, and the blood tried to go back into the atrium, but it can't. It pushed those bicuspid valves over here closed. Pressure continues to build, so now we're in the next phase, the period of ventricular ejection. Now we're going to see how does the ventricle eject that blood. So ventricular systole keeps going forward. It keeps squeezing, and as it continues to squeeze, pressure continues to rise. On the right side of the heart, pressure is going to rise until it is higher than pressure in the pulmonary trunk. On the left side, pressure is going to continue to rise until the pressure is higher than in the atrium. The moment that the pressure is higher in the ventricle than in its great vessel, the blood is going to push those semilunar valves open. And when those semilunar valves open, we get ejection of the blood. Blood in the right ventricle is going to be pressed into the pulmonary trunk. Blood in the left ventricle is going to be pressed into the aorta. Now, when blood is being pushed into the aorta, the pressure in the aorta starts to rise, and at its highest point, when blood is being pushed into it and pressure is as high as it's going to get, if we were to measure that pressure, it would be about 120 mmHg. The pressure in the aorta during ventricular systole is 120 mmHg. Keep that in mind because that's going to be really important over the next few lectures. So blood has been pushed out of the ventricles. And at this point, the ventricles, surprisingly, are not empty. There is still about 60 milliliters of blood left in each ventricle. That is called the end systolic volume, or the ESV. The ESV, the end systolic volume, is the volume of blood left in a ventricle at the end of ventricular systole. The ESV is the volume of blood left in a ventricle at the end of ventricular systole. It is not empty. Let's go back and look at the previous slides. When the ventricle was completely full, when it was most relaxed, there was 130 milliliters of blood in it. At the end of systole, there's still almost half of that left. 60 milliliters of blood left in the ventricle. So that's, you know, about 70 milliliters of blood are no longer there. The other 60 milliliters are there. So what happened to that other 70 milliliters? Where did it go? Well, it was pushed out of the ventricle into either, on the right side, into the pulmonary trunk, on the left side, into the aorta. So that 70 milliliters is what was pushed out, what was ejected during one heartbeat. So over here, that's what we call stroke volume, or SV. Stroke volume, the amount of blood pushed out of the heart in one beat is stroke volume. The amount or volume of blood pushed out of each ventricle in one beat is about 70 milliliters, and we call that the stroke volume. So we can now see putting all of those numbers together, end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume is equal to stroke volume. EDV minus ESV is equal to SV.
Now in lab, you're going to see something called the ejection fraction. I'm only mentioning it here because I want to point out that for a lecture, you don't need to know it. For a lab, you will need to know it. And ejection fraction is really just saying, of all that blood that was in the ventricle to begin with when it was relaxed, then we contracted and pushed some of that blood out, the stroke volume. What portion of that blood was pushed out? That's what the ejection fraction is. And I really hate that they call it ejection fraction because when you look at it, it's in percent form, not fraction form. So for lecture, I don't talk about it at all other than just to tell you, hey, you're going to see this and this is kind of what it is. So now we're going to get to isovolumetric relaxation. This is step four. Here, we're going to have the ventricle start to repolarize. This is when we see the T wave. When it has repolarization, following that, it's going to start to relax. It goes into diastole. The ventricle goes into diastole. It starts to relax. And as it relaxes, the pressure inside that ventricle is going to drop. And as pressure drops, the moment that pressure in the ventricles are lower than pressure in either the pulmonary trunk on the right side or the aorta on the left side, then that blood is going to try to backflow. It's going to go from the aorta back towards the left ventricle. It's going to go from the pulmonary trunk back towards the right ventricle. And just as we saw before, that backflow is going to push those semilunar valves shut. Now, once we're there, we're right back in the beginning. Pressure is going to continue to drop in the ventricles until it is less than the pressure in the atria, which are filling with blood. And as soon as the pressure in the ventricles is less than it is in the atria, then those AV valves are going to open and blood is going to flow from the atria into the ventricles, starting the whole process again. So hopefully something that really stood out was every time pressure was higher in one area than it was in the next area, blood flows from one space to the next space from high pressure to low pressure. And then these valves prevent backflow. All right, so uh, I'm not going to play this video because there's no sound with it, but all it does is just kind of animate everything we just said. Now, in your textbook on page 729, there is this picture. And maybe you really like graphs, maybe you don't. I put this up for the students that do. I'm not going to ask you anything about it. But the neat thing about it, the reason that I like to show it, is because everything that we've talked about with the heart is all shown here, plus a little extra stuff. And it's all color-coded. So. Here is what's going on in the EKG. And down here is when you hear a heart sound. And down here, it's showing you each of those parts of the cardiac cycle. And they're all color-coded, so you can see when it's this color, this is what's happening with the heart itself. This is what heart sound you're hearing. This is where we are on the EKG. Up above, it shows you ventricular volume, pressures in different parts of the heart. So it kind of pulls it all together into one image. And that is where we will stop with this lecture. It's a little shorter than some of our other lectures. But beginning with our next lecture, that's when we're going to start to see, okay, now we know how the heart works, both electrically and mechanically. Now we're going to start to see how does the heart move blood,
and keep that blood flow regulated. All right, so I will talk to you in the next lecture.